Okay, our second speaker uh, is Dr. Alan Radford, and say we're going to pick up on the subject of genomics. Um, Alan's two main interests in his research career, the first stems from his PhD, which was on the gen genetic diversity and evolution of pathogens, especially viruses. Techniques used include large-scale population sampling and robust phylogeny, as well as the next generation sequencing. And these have been used to monitor the spread of pathogens locally, nationally, and indeed internationally, and thus to try and understand how the disease process um, evolves and they evolve within it. Recent projects include canine parvovirus, coronavirus, and feline caliche virus. And in working with these pathogens, Alan has become aware of a distinct gap in the knowledge that we have concerning how, these common, how common these pathogens are in veterinary practice and whether some outbreaks of disease are actually being missed. And this indeed has led Alan and his colleagues to develop an interest in using some really big data to try and capture and survey animal diseases and ultimately to the establishment of SAVSNET um, that aims to improve the care of animals by giving us that means of identifying significant trends in the diseases that are seen by, by vets in practice. So, Alan, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, my goal is to try and link to something that Vincent said. Oops. And I've scribbled a couple of ideas down, so see if you can spot them as we go. I mean, first of all, um, thanks for being here. I have to confess to being somewhat nervous. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but to introduce uh, myself, um, Alan Radford, my email address is there. I'm very happy to um, receive emails if you've got any um, questions or comments. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to get feedback on some of the things we're trying to do. Okay, so the analogy for today is football. Uh, I know that will please some people and, and disappoint others, but don't worry, we're not really going to be talking very much about football. Uh, yes, footballers get nervous before a match, and I'm actually quite nervous, partly because you're a scary audience, partly uh, because, you know, clearly, as Vincent said, um, things are going to be very different in 15 years' time, and so it's very hard for me as a humble researcher to try and work out what life might look like, but I'm going to have a go. Um, second thing is a realisation that if you picked any one of the hundreds or thousands of veterinary researchers in, in the world to come and speak to you, you'd get a very different picture. And it's really important that you understand that. This is just my own personal flavour. But what I've tried to do is to draw from some of the methodologies that I've almost serendipitously dipotously bumped into throughout my um, 20 years of research, um, which I think have a very, very broad relevance to the future of our profession. And they are Sequencing United versus Health Informatics FC. So this is the game that we shall play. And if you like, the, the prize we're playing for is big data. Big data, that's something that unifies these two together. I've come at it from my own personal research experience with this particular disease. Anyone know what it is? Caliche virus, well done. You can tell you're not Liverpool graduates, those who said it. Liverpool graduates say Caliche virus usually, because Ros Gaskell taught them and she's posh. <laughs> right. So, um, these were my thoughts of some of the challenges. Some of the challenges that we face as a profession, uh, we have very complex diseases to solve. Um, we have an increasing recognition that one size cannot fit all. And it's just an example there at the bottom of the slide. We live in a global village, One Health. Uh, we've heard that mentioned already in the introduction. We have to deal with emerging infections, not just in animal species, but in um, for zoonoses as well. Antibacterial resistance is something that is on the radar now and will not go away. Um, we have an increasing need for local knowledge. I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. And, and also a talk about um, professional revalida revalidation. And where does the evidence come from to do that? Local knowledge I've mentioned, this is my example. I, I get this quite a lot. We get vets phoning us up saying, I work in uh, the northwest of England. This is the vet talking. I work in the northwest of England. How common is parvovirus? And so as a good academic, I go to PubMed and I pull out a 
the most recent publication I find. And I say, well, there you go. Um, in this case, it's um, Parvabas in Thailand. And it was published in 2003. I'm exaggerating slightly, but that's the situation that we're in. And quite rightly, that practitioner says to me, it's almost useless. And this is where we have a need for local data. So let's go to the first uh, of our teams, which is Sequencing United. Um, this is sequencing on the left. Um, I started sequencing in my PhD. And when I started sequencing in my PhD, I used little tubes like this. And if I was very brave, I used 96 tubes like this. And I could sequence about maybe a thousand bases a day. Remember the bases, the AGC and Ts, I could do about a thousand a day if I was brave. I ran the risk of it going wrong, but I could, I could do it. Now we can sequence um, around about a billion bases overnight. One billion bases overnight. And I want to share some of the excitement of that with you. Because I think some scientists are very clever, I'm not one of them. But in trying to go from a thousand bases a night to a billion, how can you do that? How can you do that? And someone realized that instead of using a tube for one experiment, why not put a million experiments in here? And I'm going to pass it round, and you'll see this is a mixture of oil and water. If you shake it, you get little droplets of oil, um, and each one of those is a reaction, an individual reaction. So I'm going to pass it around, you can have a look. So now not one experiment, but a million. Um, I showed you a 96 well plate, used very commonly in laboratories. This is a little bit smaller. That has about a million wells on it. One million wells on it. I'm going to pass it around for you. This is actually quite old. The technology is now smaller. Um, but this is where the sequencing now happens. It's a bit messy, that. I use it to put my coffee on in the office. Um, sequencing impacts on everything we do. Uh, yes, we can, uh, from my background, we sequence the pathogen, but we can sequence the host, and we also have to, mustn't forget the environment. And now all of these areas are accessible to us because of this huge growth in our ability to sequence. Uh, this shows you that growth. So either on the left, looking at the number of bases, or the right, looking at the number of sequences, you can see what looks like a linear increase in the amount of data that's published, um, but that's a logarithmic scale. So you can see over time, there's a logarithmic increase in the amount of data we're producing. Uh, WGS is whole genome sequences, so not just little fragments of DNA, but the whole genome. These are the clever guys, and um, Watson and Crick, who discovered the, the, the structure of DNA, Kerry Mullis, does anyone know what he did? He invented PCR. <coughs> Without PCR, we could do none of the things that we're currently doing. Fred Sanger, who uh, was the first to um, develop um, sequencing for the masses. And then these guys um, are the guys who really invented this more modern technology. Or at least two of the guys. There's a whole bunch of people doing it. Um, and I've just picked two to show here. And one of the nice things about being close to Cambridge is, apart from Kerry Mullis, all of these guys have a very strong association with Cambridge. So there's a massive growth in the amount of sequencing we can do. That led to uh, the paper with the most authors on it, um, the sequencing of the human genome in 2001. Actually, that was using still this technology. Still this technology. Um, this is just an example I pulled from the literature of uh, the genome of a tumour on the right from an individual patient and the recognition that if you sequence the tumour, you can spot mutations that allow you to target treatment. Target treatment. So th this particular, it was a lady with a particular tumour, her sequence type responded particularly well to a particular drug. And when she's put on it, um, I'm not a diagnostic imager, but her tumour disappeared. And that was only possible because they sequenced her and her tumour. All very doable now. 
Um, here's another example. I won't ask if any of you are on statins, but the odds are some of you will be. Um, and it's clear uh, medics have known for some time that we, we vary in our response to statins. Now you just sequence lots of people and you try to look for associations between genome sequence, statin response, and they start to find all sorts of new mutations that allow medics to choose to target the particular product to the particular person. I wonder if we could imagine ourselves doing that in, in, veterinary, in the veterinary profession in 15 years' time. Um, you're going to wonder how much it will cost. And that will be the, um, I'll come to that in a second, but that will clearly be an important factor. As technology has become cheaper and more available, um, it has spread from being used in the very uh, prominent species like human and mouse uh, to being democratized, if you like. This is looking at mammalian published genomes. Mammalian published genomes. Um, perhaps the number you want to look at is, um, well, the names are down the left, so you have to uh, remind yourself of your Latin. Um, but we see cow, we see dog, we see cat, we see sheep, uh, and many, many other animal species. Full genome sequences are now available for them, opening up completely new areas of science. Even for me, the cat, one of, in terms of research, probably one of the lowest valued uh, mammal species, but there is now a reasonable genome sequence for the cat. Um, I'm going to stop talking about the mammal now, the, the, um, the host on my first slide. I'm going to start talking about the pathogen, which is my background. Um, the, what was the RCS Trust has a, I hope, a really proud pedigree in this. They sponsored us at Liverpool to use next generation sequencing, that's what the new technology is called, right at its infancy um, to uh, democratise it and use it for veterinary pathogens. <coughs> And so we were able to produce full genome sequences for 75 bacteria, 16 viruses and three parasites in a three-year project, something that would have been completely impossible um, five years before that. For the money, it was a big investment for the RCBS Trust, but for the money they invested five years earlier, we could have sequenced one bacteria. Um, but during the course of three years, uh, almost 100 veterinary pathogens. And this is probably the slide I'm most proud of in my, um, my research career. These are some of the animals that we sequence pathogens from. Because the cost was so low, because of the new technology, we were able to sequence pathogens from, from um, blue tits, from mice, from penguins, from, um, from fish. Completely unheard of five years before. How much does it cost? Well. Uh, this has been a target for the, um, for the sector for some time, the $1,000 genome. The $1,000, that's a human genome, not a, not a pathogen genome, a human genome, $1,000 genome. And we are pretty close to it now, $1,000 genome. Would you pay $1,000 for your genome to be sequenced? Um, if you could sequence it, what would you do with it? Well, there is a smartphone app you can put your genome on. And the vision is that you will go to your medic, say, I'm feeling a bit, mm, they'll diagnose you, they'll say, show me your genome. It's OK, based on your sequence, this is the drug for you. This is the drug for you. It's kind of a big leap. We're not there yet. But I kind of sense we're not far away from it. It is happening in oncology. Tumors are being sequenced. People are getting specific treatment based on the sequence of their tumor. It's all about democratizing. Democratizing is about bringing the cost down so that it becomes accessible, but also making the technology itself available. And the companies who make these machines um, are very, very aware that they want their machines not to be in a research institute, because there'll only be 10 of those in the UK. They want them to be in doctor surgeries, in veterinary surgeries. So this is one company's offering at the top. The machine on the left is aimed at a research institute, very, very high throughput. Uh, you need quite um, uh, high-powered technicians to run it. The machine on the right is a plug and play, like your coffee maker. Uh, you plug your sample in, it gives you the information at the end. Uh, look at this thing down here on the right. This is from a company called Oxford Nanopore. The sequencing machine is that. 
that. It's a, essentially, it's a USB key. You plug it into a laptop, sequencing reaction happens, the analysis is done on your laptop. That technology is not licensed, uh, not released yet, but it will be soon. So absolutely, this um, ability to sequence, the cost is becoming accessible, the machine work is becoming accessible. And so the um, sequencing of mammals, sequencing of their pathogens, and sequencing of their environment uh, is becoming very, very available. Are the uh, things still going around? Have they got stuck on a table? Good. Pretty cool, huh? Slight change of subject. Um, I have a slightly um, schizophrenic research career at the moment because half of my life is sequencing, half of my life is this other part, the other football team, which is Health Informatics FC. Um, health Informatics is all about electronic health records. Um, the vast majority of animals in the UK go to a vet, of companion animals, uh, and the vast majority of vets are, have electronic records. <coughs> Those records are incredibly valuable for the animal, the owner, and the vet. But if you can hoover them up into a centralized database, they become hugely valuable for research. Um, and I think this is a, a, a very big area for us. It's about harnessing and reusing electronic health records for research. The medical profession is going for this in a very big way. You know about this because there was a bit of an embarrassing situation last year where we should have all got a letter from the NHS saying, we want your electronic health record so that we can use it for research. We can turn you into a research patient. That was the phrase David Cameron used, the research patient. So that the um, huge value of this unified NHS could be uh, used to generate income, essentially, generate income for UK PLC. Um, that's stalled slightly, but the principle is still there. The government wants, wants permission to use your electronic health record. And the research side, massive investment. Massive investment. If you're interested in this area, just remember the name FAR and have a look at it when you get home, the FAR Institute, um, funded uh, probably about um, 80 million pounds worth of funding across the UK to develop the UK as a centre of excellence in using electronic health data. We have a challenge as a veterinary profession, um, partly because we're about 10 years behind, um, but partly because we have a very fragmented industry, very fragmented data. We have some ethical issues, but actually I think we've worked through those, and data governance issues. Um, we have some funding issues. But there is a um, growing activity. I've just put some examples here. I think I've put them in alphabetical order, um, just to uh, for this audience. A uh, growing activity. Probably the best two examples are SARSnet and Vet Compass. And I'm just going to put two slides up for each, so you can see the sorts of things that they're doing. Um, so this is SARSnet, how how the data can be. Uh, turn. This is hoovering up data from vets in practice. Uh, the slide on the top left, I can't move, this is really difficult, uh, shows the age profile of dogs in practice. The slide on the top right, the red bar, shows how common diarrhea is in dogs compared to cats. The slide on the bottom left shows vaccine intervals in individual veterinary practices and how that interval is infected by insurance. Okay. And the slide on the right shows antibacterial use. The big green bar shows that rabbits get fluoroquinolone, just to orient orientate you. I don't want you to learn anything from those slides other than there's a whole range of data uh, of research that these data can be put to. Um, we also get data from commercial diagnostic labs, and you can now go to the website and see a map of, in this case, parvovirus diagnosis. So they, things that we were not able to do uh, two or three years ago, we are now beginning to be able to do. Um, Vet Compass, um, uh, similar to ourselves, huge amounts of uh, peer-reviewed publications coming out of the use of electronic health data, addressing a whole range of diseases, not just infectious, but a whole range of different diseases, and some really exciting ways of presenting that data. Um, not just to the veterinary profession, but to members of the public through these nice infographics. 
you can go to their websites and see some really beautiful, again, infographics showing disease prevalence in the top left and uh, showing which parts of animals are most likely to get affected by disease, bottom right, all through reusing electronic health data. The prize, if we can do it right, um, for Health Informatics FC, to get big data efficiently, i.e., it costs us to do this research, but it's not that expensive. It's not that expensive. We can get real-world data. There's a recognition uh, among scientists and universities that the populations we study tend to be not completely relevant, but not typical. Um, we need to be studying the animals that are seen, the vast majority of animals that are seen, and where they're seen in first opinion practice. Same is true in, in, uh, for our medical colleagues that are interested in what GPs see not what get to the, to the hospitals. The data can be in real time. Why should we wait? Um, the data can be very research ready and it can be linkable to other databases. For example, we can now link all that veterinary data to climate or to uh, deprivation data to look for new associations with disease. So, uh, just to summarize, um, I think both of these things, sequencing data, health informatics, have a huge potential role in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, not just in infection, but across the whole range of uh, the animals that we see. I would like to suggest, actually, be slightly cheeky and suggest we can link the two together. Um, this is something that our medical colleagues are now doing in this very complicated project of which SAVSnet is a tiny part, the idea here is when you have diarrhea and you phone up NHS Direct, that data will go to a statistician in Lancaster. They will put your postcode and time into a statistical model to spot outbreaks. Where an outbreak is identified, samples, samples will be requested. They will go into next generation sequencing in Liverpool and whole genome sequences will be produced in a clinically relevant time frame. That for me is really exciting. This is a pilot project being run through the NHS for five million pounds. Five million pounds, pilot project. But if they can get it to work on diarrhea in the Northwest, then the principle can be rolled out to other things too. So last slide. Um, these are the challenges I kind of set myself or set the veterinary profession at the beginning. And um, perhaps some of the solutions that can come through unifying sequencing and health informatics. Uh, we can get markers and breeding programs, genetic markers of disease and breeding programs. We can move to personalized medicine. This was one of uh, Vincent's thing. He talked about a segment of one. I really like that expression. Um, take it, that means shut up. Nope. Is that right? No, it's not. <laughs> this is just my tie. Yeah. Is it very nice? Oh. <laughs> um, we, a segment of one. We should be treating individual animals not at population levels. We can certainly improve our diagnostic testing. We can get enhanced surveillance. Uh, we can promote the stewardship of antibiotics. Uh, local data, local data, local data, local data. I think it's really, really important. I'm fed up telling a practitioner in Wigan what's happening in Thailand. And um, all of that added together is, I guess, just evidence-based veterinary medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, again, another fascinating insight into, uh, well, what's happening now and how it can actually be taken forward. I was particularly interested in the um, genetic sequencing uh, with relation to statins, but uh, that's on a, on a personal level. Uh -huh. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so uh, questions from the audience, please. Colin. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, a very interesting talk and some very um, uh, um, mind-blowing ideas for somebody like myself that hadn't really thought about these things. Um, I just wondered what you felt the impact would be on vets on the ground in, in the sense that it looks to me as this might be something that gives us a lot more information but in many ways puts the skill into the piece of machinery that we have in front of us. And do you see this as uh, 
the vet just being somebody who uh, interprets the information that they have in front of them and does not in any way de-skill the profession any further than it has at the moment. Um, I am a vet by training. I worked briefly in veterinary practice some time ago. But, I mean, that's what vets do. You, you send off the diagnostic tests, you get the results, and you interpret them. That's a really important thing. As an infection, uh, uh, someone interested in infection, we always say we, we don't diagnose disease, we diagnose infection. It's your job to diagnose disease and to understand the relevance of the results that you have to the animal that you see. You're the one with the animal. So I, I, I can't see getting away from that hugely important uh, role the vet has with the individual owner and the individual animal, taking what can be quite complex results and making them relevant to that individual relationship. So I don't see that's in any way threatened. Um, I can see a bunch of new technology arriving in practice. Um, I can see you perhaps not having to rely on anyone from the big corporate diagnostic labs here. Uh, go for it. Maybe, may, maybe there'll be an ability for you to do some of the diagnostic testing you currently send off. Um, because the, uh, if, if that vision of a little USB key that you plug into a laptop actually works out, and we are looking at 15 years here, can you do it? Why send that away to a, to a big corporate um, um, commercial diagnostic lab? So no, I, I don't see a threat there at all. I can see that it would empower people. See that empower people. people. It, if we ever got to the stage where animals came with a genome, I, I can imagine if a dog genome cost a thousand dollars, six hundred pounds. I can imagine a bunch of people would pay that now, even though we maybe can't use it, but but they would want their vets to be involved in the analysis of it. Sorry for coming back, but I suppose the question is, does it have to be a vet that does the interpretation? Can you see it moving to a point where it's someone of a uh, more technical nature uh, and less less of a professional that uh, passes that information on to the to the, uh, to no. the owner? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, at the, at the end of, at the end of it, you will get a piece of information that says uh, ten percent of the bacteria in this sample were Bordetella. That's what this machine will tell you, and it will tell you it really quickly. It might say that. Um, 80% of those border teller are susceptible to ampicillin. might give you that information too. Uh, it might give you that information in about 12 hours. Um, but you still need to translate that to the owner. You still need to take into account the, uh, what they can afford, what treatments they want, what their expectations are for their animal. So, no, I think your role's secure. But if you're really worried, you can come and do some research with us instead. <laughs> Presumably on that role as well, I mean, there's a huge amount of um, DNA profiling that goes on, particularly within the equine sector and to a certain extent within the cattle sector, trying to um, line up um, cattle that are misidentified, that that could be done under the same sort of apparatus. Yeah. With, with, the, with the veterinary surgeon providing the validity of the, the signature on the form. So looking at per parentage. Yeah, parentage. Yeah. Checking, yeah. Similar sort of uh, you know, science, really. It is similar science that at the moment the technology is cheaper to do it by a traditional method, which is PCR and se sequencing the old way. Um, I think the Animal Health Trust will do dog parentage testing for about 60 or 70 pounds from memory, which is amazing. Um, but I can imagine the technology is changing over time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good, thank you. Another question over here. Yeah, so I'm looking at the personalized med medicine sort of segment of one situation. Clearly, in human medicine, the um, analysis of human tumors, tumors is the most important thing in terms of um, treatment and prognosis. Um, where do you see that going in veterinary medicine, and how does that fit with uh, doing what you should do rather than what you can do? Um, I'm maybe not the expert to ask on all of these things, but I know in um, we've done some typing of tumors already in dogs, actually with the traditional technology with Laura Blackwood, and already you can see what clinically looks like a very homogenous tumor type. When you look at it genetically, there is a huge range of variation, and you can see within that variation markers for, um, for, treatment, for, for, for treatment success. So I, th I think in, in cancer, I think the, the technology would very quickly get to the point where it could give choices, but 
again, it comes back to what, what your colleague said. Ultimately, um, choices are, can be very difficult for owners and it needs a veterinary profession to talk them through those choices and to help them decide whether um, they even want to find out that information. I do think it's really, it is incredibly hard for owners. I mean, I'm quite remote from clinical practice now. It's very hard for, for owners when faced with a massive range of things that can be done. Um, I think it's really, really important that the role of the vet um, can allow certain owners to say, I'm not going to do any of that and not feel guilty about it. And um, that role must always be there. Technology mustn't remove that role. But for certain owners where, where may, maybe it's through insurance or for other reasons, they want more choice, then great. Just, uh, just thinking about um, genome sequencing uh, in relation to horses, you may find for an income stream for yourselves that actually genome sequencing from horses might be able to go to the highest bidders, for example, uh, Ladbrokes or, or Paddy Power or somebody else like that, I would have thought. Genome sequencing is a way of spotting performance, would you think? Not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I can comment on that one. <laughs> Sounds interesting, though. Almost sort of asking the question myself and my other Royal College colleagues here, but the, the diagnosis of disease on the basis of laboratory tests is an act of veterinary surgery, and the diagnosis of disease on the basis of imaging, digital or otherwise, is an act of veterinary surgery. Is the diagnosis of disease on the basis of a genome an act of veterinary surgery? Is it any different to diagnosing parasitic disease on a faecal egg count? Pose the question. I don't know. It's maybe one we should be considering for the future. I mean, that, those technologies are there. So the Animal Health Trust offer about 30 tests for inherited single gene defects. Um, and they are really easy to interpret. I mean, it says, yes, this dog is homozygous, heterozygous or not. Um, so that those issues must be being dealt with by the animal health. Well, the animal health trust and others. I know other places do it. I should say that, of course. Um, so those issues are being dealt with already. It's just the scale. Instead of just what, what the animal health trust do at the moment is they will sequence about 500 bases of a genome, which is uh, about 500 million bases in size. Um, whereas in 10 years' time, you'll sequence the whole genome, which will allow you to move not away from just worrying about the single gene defects which have largely been understood uh, and moving towards hopefully some of these more complex polygenic disorders like osteoarthritis or diabetes or so on. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting. I'm non-clinical and I found it very interesting. Um, from a practice point of view, uh, the genome sequencing, um, from an insurance point of view, Perhaps they might be interested in because it will, you know, make more accurate treatment and therefore lower their costs. So that would be an interesting way of looking at it. And of course, the other flip side of that yeah. is almost um, <laughs> genome sequencing as a way of setting premiums. Um, I keep maybe someone in the room will know. There's a really amazing film about uh, a, society, a society in the future where genome sequencing happens when you're born. Gattaca, is that it? And there's this guy who is in a wheelchair, he can't do the stuff he wants, so he has to steal a DNA sequence from the, someone else. Um, and the whole, ev everywhere you went, there were sensors that sequenced the genome to make sure you were who you were, who you said you were. Amazing film, quite dark, I'd say. That can be your homework for when you get home to watch that. But yeah, there is a flip side to it, is insurance companies may um, may want people to uh, pay more for certain genomes. But equally, I think there's an opportunity in breeding programs to say, well, actually, uh, these two genomes are not particularly compatible. These two genomes are. Hopefully, that won't happen in... There are different issues for humans uh, to have those questions, but in dog breeding or cattle breeding or horse breeding, I can imagine a situation where people are trying to pick genomes to put together. I guess as well with, with some of the infections, thinking about some of the parasitic infections in my sort of field, in the Ospera, things like that, that could be 
use as part of fast track program for eradication rather than just line breeding on, on the currently available diagnostics. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of possibilities as, as well as threats in, in, in a lot of this. So, Robin. Uh, yeah. Um, what, we, what we know is that there's, as been said earlier, about f towards half of the animals in, in never, never see a veterinary surgeon. And I think one of the reasons for that is that some of our clients are, are, are intimidated already by the sophistication of veterinary practice and they don't come in for fear of the cost and the fact that they may be embarrassed that they can't afford the things that we want or we might tend to do something they don't want to do. And I think we're frightening them away to a certain extent. Can you see how we can use this super high tech to actually create, to, to create veterinary medicine that is more accessible and that is less intimidating? Because if we do, if, if we just simply end up doing less for less, doing more for less people, then yeah. although that will be very uh, academically satisfying, mm -hmm. I think it will be a failure. I think some of these things, if if you look down the list here, some of these things are not aimed at, at always aimed at the vet in practice. So I don't think we should just view it from the prism of a vet in practice. So for example, markers and breeding programs may be aimed at a. Uh, you know, a, a large international company breeding cattle, or uh, or, or whatever. So there's there's lots of opportunities that don't involve clients uh, in the decisions. Um, I think some of the big data from things like SouthNet and Vet Compass have desperately focused at members of the public. Go and look at their websites. They are public-facing websites with huge amounts of information about the diseases their pets can get, uh, diseases on a local level, um, so they can see what risks. They face not what, what not what the risk is in Thailand, but what the risk is in Wigan. I seem to pick on Wigan all the time. Um, so I think there's big opportunities there for personalising and um, removing some of that threat. Infectious disease diagnosis is um, something that vets have been doing for hundreds of hundreds of years. Why should we worry about the next level of technology? Um, a really exciting area for the sequencing technology in a bit outside of my area of expertise, but um, that links lots of things together is um, sequencing the rumen, the contents of the rumen. Um, global warming is a big problem. The cows make a lot of methane. If you sequence the, by sequencing the organisms in the gene, in the rumen, you understand much better the methane production. And you can manipulate that uh, with feeding and then reduce methane production. So huge amounts of opportunities. They don't, but they're not all focused on I guess a vet and a general practitioner. That's a drink for everybody in the bar after. Yeah, <laughs> Nick, last question. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so this project, the Vet Futures project, is about setting serious ambitions for the veterinary profession. And um, I suppose with that in mind, the one thing you said, which I is often said about the veterinary world, is it's 15 years behind uh, the human world um, in human medicines and advancements. So if we were to be truly ambitious, it's probably an unfair question just to ask, ask of you, because you. maybe the rest of us should think about this too, but what would it take to play serious catch-up? So what if we were really ambitious and we said, actually, we want to make the kind of progress, we want to be almost at the level of, uh, of, of, of the human equivalence to, to these uh, in, in the next five years, ten years? How, how feasible would that be and what kind of scale are we looking at in terms of investment? That's a big question for, for me, a little humble scientist from Liverpool. Um, I, I think the, I put this slide up because, hopefully got the gist of what they're trying to do here. This is a five million pound pilot in the NHS to try and link all this stuff together. Um, the project's been going a year and a half and currently no, no member of the public has taken part. No member of the public has taken part. SavsNet and Vet Compass could do the same. SASNet is a tiny part of this project, and we have sent them data on about 200,000 veterinary consultations with, with um, information on diarrhea in them. Um, so we can actually be a much more nimble in some of this science than our medical colleagues. I think that's an opportunity for us. Um, they talked about NHS England and NHS Wales. We talk about SASNet. You don't have, you don't have Vet Compass. You don't have Vet Compass England and Vet Compass Wales, you have Vet Compass Subnet because we don't recognise borders. Some of the barriers to the science for human colleagues are much higher. Ethics is much higher. Massive problem sending personal 
medical data around a network of scientists like that. But we can do it. We do it very carefully. We can do it for animals. So in some places, we're actually ahead. And I think that's an opportunity for us. On the sequencing side, I guess one thing we can do that medical colleagues can't is breeding programs. And we should work to those, those strengths. If we want to um, breed the best animals, then maybe we can use sequencing information to help us do that. Thank you, Alan. Um, I, as chair, must apologise for not keeping to time, but I think it's a reflection on two fascinating talks that uh, that we've had. So thank you very, very much for that. Thanks for the opportunity.